Before every political party picks a new leader, there's the tradition of saying farewell to the former leader. Ontario Liberals are doing that right now in Mississauga as they get set to replace Kathleen Wynne with a new leader tomorrow. Wynne was Ontario's 25th Premier and leaves behind a dramatic legacy. First ever female Premier, first ever openly gay Premier, one majority government victory and one hellacious defeat. Frankly, it all makes for a pretty good story, which is why we have invited the MPP for Don Valley West Back to our studio. So nice to see you again. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, Steve. Let's just fess up right off the top. We are taping this Friday morning because, of course, right now as this program airs, you are being feted in Mississauga <laughs> by your party uh, for your years as leader and then cabinet minister before that. So I'm just curious, what's in your head right now? I'm nervous. I, I mean, I know um, that tonight there will be a room full of people um, most of whom I will have worked with in one way or another or have met with, some of them my staffers, some of them people I've been in political life with since, you know, 25 years ago. Um, so I love them, you know, and that's what I'm, that's what I'm going to want to say to them tonight, that I'm so, so grateful for everything that they've done for me and for the party and for the people of Ontario, quite frankly. You said before we sat down here that you haven't slept well for two nights. How come? Well, I... I I've been writing my speech, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I've been thinking about um, how uh, how it's how it's going to feel to be there. And what I really want is to be able to encourage the party. Um, you know, you said a hellacious defeat. It was. It was a very very tough moment that June 18 uh, election. And so I. I want us to move on from that, and that's what, that's what this weekend is about. It's about the future, and so I want to hit the right tone in, uh, in encouraging that. That election was 20 months ago, and I'm wondering, at what point do you stop asking yourself, gosh, I wonder if I'd done this instead of this, whether it might have turned out differently? <laughs> I don't know, Steve. <laughs> there's, some, there's some questions I've said to students over the last uh, few months. I may be thinking about these for the rest of my life. Hmm. You know? I mean, you talk to, talk to people like David Peterson, even talk to Bill Davis. Like, there are things that stay with you forever. It's a matter of putting them in perspective and not letting them, you know, not letting them drag you down. But um, there were really profound moments um, in that election campaign and in my career, but if we're talking about that election campaign, when I went out a week before the election and told people that I wasn't going to be the premier and I really needed them to think about voting liberal in spite of my, you know, being the leader at that moment, that was so hard. It was really, really hard. I was there. And you barely got through it. I know. It was yeah, tough. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I'll never, I'll never totally forget that. Mm. Um, but that's okay, because it's part of who I am. You mentioned David Peterson, and I once had an argument with him about this, because he said, David Peterson won the biggest majority government in Ontario history in 1987, and three years later lost an election and lost his seat. He did. And he said, people don't remember your triumphs, they only remember your defeats. I don't think he's right, but what do you think? I hope not. I really hope not. Um, I mean, I, I hope people remember the work we did, you know? I hope there are some people in the province, in the country, who know that Ontario led the way to get enhanced retirement security, you know? I, I hope that people remember the work we did around poverty reduction. I hope that when this country, when this province um, reinstates a basic income, either policy or pilot or moves on that, I hope that it's remembered that we did that first, you know? We got there. So I think there are a lot of good things that we did that I'm going to hold on to as, uh, as the, the legacy. Um, I'm going to talk about those things tonight um, because I want, I want people in the room to remember the good things too. I mean, obviously the defeat, it, it hurt a lot of people. Um, but, but the work that we did, first under Dalton and then my government. I mean, we were there for 15 years and we did a lot of work to build a foundation and I hope we can remember that. It is inevitable that when there is a leadership convention to replace the former leader, that during the course of that campaign, stuff is said about the former government and the former leader yeah. because that's just the nature of the game and you get that. Is there anything that has been said during the course of this campaign that you've taken exception to? So I'm going to be really honest with you. I haven't watched a lot of the debates. I've watched bits because I don't want to 
I don't want to um, put myself into that conversation. Mm -hmm. It's a different exercise, you know? Um, those six candidates, and I have, I have listened to them in bits and I have a respect for all of them, um, but they've got to establish their own persona. They've got to establish their own um, message. And, uh, and I, I know that once we get through the leadership race, Everybody will be working together, and that's when I want to be part of the conversation. You know, because during the course of the campaign, and they did a debate in this studio not too long ago, we heard expressions like, you know, we stopped listening, we moved too far to the left, it was more about Queen's Park telling the regions what we thought instead of the regions telling Queen's Park what they thought. You got a problem with any of that stuff? Well, sure, <laughs> sure, because I don't, I don't believe all of it. Um, I think there's, you know, there may be a grain in truth in, a grain of truth in some of it, um, but I but I don't want to be defensive, Steve. You know, I don't. I didn't want to go through the last six months feeling defensive and feeling resentful. And so there's no point in me listening to um, that debate when that debate is among those people. They're going to have to decide once uh, once one of them is chosen how they're going to work together. I'm going to be part of that team because I'm still an MPP. But I don't need to go into the next two years feeling resentful because I know that people have had to distance themselves from me. So I, I feel I've, I've sent a note to all of them uh, today wishing them luck. You know, I, I've encourage them to enjoy the moment because it's a very special time. They've all been working really hard and I have a lot of good feelings about them. I don't harbor any resentment or defensiveness because I have not, I've not immersed myself in that conversation. I do notice from time to time, Bob Ray, one of your predecessors as Premier, is on Twitter, often still, I mean, we're 30 years later since he got elected, often still defending decisions he made when people take a shot at him on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine engaging in that kind of a way going forward? I don't think I don't think I'll be doing that Not your on style? Twitter. I, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. I you know, I think that I think that I will always have opinions about what's happening in politics in this country and beyond. Um, but I I don't think I'm going to be having debates except when we're having a policy discussion in a uh, in a sort of constructive way. Mm. You know, I think that uh, for example, I was at uh, Waterloo with one of my former colleagues, John Malloy, the other week, and um, I was in his politics class, and we were talking about the, the Hydro One decision. Mm -hmm. And it was a great conversation. You know, I laid out all the issues. Um, I laid out the facts for the students. Should we remind people? This the, was sorry, it. Hydro One, the decision to uh, partially sell uh, Hydro One to the private sector. Um, the people of Ontario ret retained 40%, actually more than 40%, but um, the majority share went into uh, into the private sector. And we did that in and order to be able to... to build transit and, and infrastructure. Um, anyway, we had a great discussion and uh, and it was helpful for those young people to hear the sort of behind the scenes political discussion that went on. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, all these smart young people thought we made the right decision. So given enough time, hmm. <laughs> we can have those conversations. So th th uh, that's interesting, because I've often heard it said that, I have often heard it said by your former cabinet colleagues that, that the problem with that decision was not so much the decision itself, but the way it was communicated and rolled out. Well, and that's what yeah. the students, that's actually what the students came back at me with. They said, hmm. you know, maybe if you'd been able to explain this better. And I don't know if that's true or not. And I don't know what the explanation, what the, what the vehicle for that explanation would have been. But I do believe that making, laying out the argument makes it a lot easier for people to accept that decision. Mm -hmm. As you, I mean, you point out, you're still a member of the Ontario legislature. Yeah. You sit in the House. Uh, a lot of ex-leaders, you know, don't show up. You show up. And you get to watch on a daily basis your opponents essentially dismantle what you spent five years and 138 days as premier <laughs> doing. Yeah. What's that like? Well, it's, uh, it's very hard, you know? It's not, uh, it's not a pleasant experience, um, that part of it. Um, but what is important is that I'm there to ask questions of the ministers. I have a different experience than anybody else in the legislature. There are no other former premiers sitting in the legislature, so um, so I'm able to I'm able to ask questions with a background knowledge, um, both as minister and as uh, as premier. Um, 
I'm also able, it was interesting, yesterday, so on Thursday, there was a debate in the House. It was a private member's motion by Randy Hillier, who's the member for Lanark. Went Something in Eastern Ontario. Out there in Eastern yeah. Ontario, yeah. Independent, um, former he's conservative. He's an independent. He's an independent. So he sits over with us. We're all in, in the sort of rump on the opposition side. Um, and he brought in a motion to set up a committee, a standing committee on Indigenous relations. Mm -hmm. And it, it, on the face of it, it looked like a very good thing and, and so on. Anyway, I was sitting in my office doing some work and I was listening to the debate on the monitor. And at one point I decided I, I have to go downstairs and I have to speak to this mm -hmm. because even though what he was saying sounded like a good thing, I knew that the motivation, the intention behind it was very much a law and order, get those indigenous people out of the way of the economy. So the intention behind it was antithetical to what I believed in. So I was able to go down into the legislature, get myself on the record, make it clear to the indigenous members in the house that I was gonna support this because they were supporting it, but that we needed to be very careful about the intention because there have been decades, generations of words on pages that have not, have not um, borne the result that Indigenous people want. That's just one example of why it's important that we have people in the legislature with a mix of experience. And, and so I have found that for the last 20 months, um, that has been an important role for me to play, as well as doing the work in my constituency. Did they vote on it? They did, and, and it, it, it passed. It passed. It, it passed. So the committee's going to happen. It, well, it's a private member's bill, so oh. it, it depends so whether we'll it gets taken up. But all of the Indigenous members, and I, and uh, Mike Schreiner from the, um, the Green Party, mm -hmm. we all spoke in the same way about the intention. And so it was, it's just important that, uh, you know, the Liberal voice is on the record. I, I'm going to change focus on you now. There are 25 portraits at Queen's Park of former premiers, and as they say on Sesame Street... <laughs> One of these things is not like the other. Exactly right. <laughs> yeah. We are going to... You want to put this up, Sheldon? Okay. That's the, the one, that's the one of these things that <laughs> doesn't look like, like the, the other. other. Yeah. Overall, as a, as a portrait, uh, what is the statement that you wanted to say by choosing Linda as your artist and having her paint you looking like that? I chose Linda Dobbs mm -hmm. because she had painted David Peterson. I met, I met with a number of artists. Um, I was really drawn to David Peterson's portrait because there was a vitality to it and it was very realistic. And I believed that she captured his expression. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted, to have, I wanted to have my real self captured, you know, with all, with all my wrinkles. We laughed because I wanted to get it done very quickly after, uh, after I had lost for two reasons. One, because um, I wanted young girls to see it. I wanted it to get up. You know, I didn't want it to be six years because there are thousands of kids who go through the legislature every year and I wanted them to see a woman on the wall. And I also said to her, I'm like the Dorian Gray mirror, you know, I'm, uh, I'm aging. So let's get it up there because I want you to paint the wrinkles. <laughs> well, you know, every other portrait, of course, is basically an old white man with nothing right. in the background. And we're going to look, the portraits today, they tell a story. There's lots of stuff in the background, and we want to take a few close-up looks here. So, Sheldon, next one here. Okay, what's that thing beside your right hand that obviously was important for you to have in the shot? That is an eagle feather that was given to me by the um, group of women drummers who were at my uh, swearing-in as premier. Okay, next shot, please, Sheldon. Okay, you're, you're a jogger, so that, that was pretty obvious. Running shoe. But why not? And a the other one's right beside it. It's right behind it. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, but I wondered why not a red shoe? I always remember you in red running shoes. Uh, you know, I campaigned often in red running shoes, but those are actually my running shoes. Those are the real ones. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Sheldon, next one, please. A stack of books. Yeah. Significance of those. So, uh, biography of Pierre Trudeau, who really helped me articulate my uh, vision of the society that we want. Uh, the book underneath it is a book on lesbian parenting. Jane and I wrote a chapter in that book. Um, the next one is the, some stories of Richmond Hill, old stories of Richmond Hill, which is where I grew up. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next one is uh, Book of the Pan Parapan Games, uh, which I'm very proud of as an accomplishment. And then the book on the bottom is a book of photographs from northwestern Ontario in the Kenora Lake of the Woods area, which I, I love all of Ontario, but I think the Lake of the Woods is one of the most beautiful places in the world. Special connection with that. Just beautiful, hmm. yeah. Okay. Sheldon, next picture again. We've got flowers and then the bell. 
What's the story on the flowers and the bell? So the school bell uh, was given to me when I um, left the, the Toronto District School Board. I was a trustee. But it's there because education is what brought me into politics, hmm. advocating for publicly funded education. And the tulips um, have a couple of um, meanings or a bit of significance. One is that I lived in Holland for three years. My first two kids were born there. And it was in Holland that I really became much more conscious of what we could be doing to conserve energy, to be environmentally responsible. I never drove my car in Holland. We, we were on transit all the time. And so I found during my political career, I found myself going back to those experiences in the Netherlands that really then informed, you know, our policies on climate change, the work that, the work that we did on environmental protection. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I think we got one more. Sheldon, let's do the last one. This is, I guess, a clever way of sneaking the rest of the family into the, <laughs> yeah. into the portrait. Who's yeah. all here? So Jane and I are at the back there. We're, um, that was a, one of the red carpet events at TIFF one year. Um, and then the front picture is my three kids, um, Chris and Jess and Maggie. Um, and then the picture where we're sitting with, in the trees, it, those are my grandkids, Olivia, Claire and Hugh and Jane and I, sitting in the botan botanical gardens or Edwards Gardens in my riding. I think David Peterson did that in his portrait yeah, as well. Yeah, he's got his family in there. Yeah, in the, in the picture. picture. Yeah. Okay. There we go. So go to Queen's Park, check out the portraits. <laughs> yeah. I, you know what I think? I, I actually think, Steve, that we should, and I've talked about this with uh, David Warner, who's one of the former par parliamentarians. Um, I think we should have a little explanatory note on the, on the wall beside the portraits, yeah. because there are things in uh, some of the other portraits that have some significance, and, I, and people won't get that unless it's written down somewhere. So I'm, I'm going to try to work on that. That's a good idea. Bob Ray has a laptop computer on his desk because he's the first premier ever to send an email. Yeah. That's why yeah. the computer's on his desk. Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, tomorrow is the big day. Six candidates, they're going to pick a, a new person to replace you. They're all probably, as we speak, uh, honing the last messages of their speeches mm -hmm. that they want to give. And the speeches start at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Can I, I just, before you ask me yeah, this sure. question, can I just do a, just do a, just a minute on John Fraser? The because interim leader. The interim leader. Sure. John Fraser, the member for Ottawa South, came into this terribly difficult situation. Mm -hmm. And he really brought us together and held us together, you know? Um, he did it with grace and kindness and... Uh, a little and bit of humor, we, too. Humor. Mm -hmm. He's a funny, funny man. Mm -hmm. um, but he's a gentle man, you know? And, uh, and so he was... He was exactly what we needed to try to heal a bit from uh, from that election loss. So, so tonight's tonight's hard for him too. You know, mm. we were talking about it yesterday in the legislature. It was his last day as leader, and we were both we were both saying, "Okay, here we are, sitting in the dustbin of history, the two of us." Um, but he's been he's been terrific. So I don't want to I don't want to skip over that as we go to the next leader. Understood. Fair point. Fair point. Uh, I have no hesitation saying this. I've seen probably hundreds of speeches at leadership conventions over the years. And yours was the best one I ever saw. It absolutely was, hands down, a 10 out of 10. So I'm going to ask you, what do you need to do in a leadership speech to connect with delegates? So I've, uh, I've talked with, um, with some, of the, some of the candidates. And the only thing I have said to them is, this is your chance to say exactly what you want to say. Mm -hmm. You know, take your heart and put it out there because people want to know who you are. That's what I tried to do. I wrote my own speech in that, uh, in, for that convention. And uh, so I've encouraged all of them to do that. And I, I don't know what else to say, you know. And then I said, practice. Mm. Practice it a lot because mm. you're going to be so nervous. There are so many people in the room. And, um, you know, it's, you want to not leave anything on the table after making that speech. And that's, that's how I felt after I made that speech in uh, 2013. It's like, I've done my best, folks, and now you're going to make the decision. I can't, I can't give you anything more. One of the most memorable parts of your speech was something that did not go at all according to the way you <laughs> planned it. Sheldon, let's roll that clip, please. <laughs> and to paraphrase a very, very dear friend, we are the Ontario Liberal Party, the best province, best <laughs> Oh, and that was the big line. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to do it again. <laughs> we are, we are the Ontario 
Liberal Party, the best party in the best province, in the best country in the world. Thank you. How do you think the speech went? I was very happy with it. I was very happy. I felt, I felt that I did it exactly the way I wanted to. Um, of course, there'd been lots of practice, and uh, you never quite know how it's going to go. Lots of practice, and you flubbed the, the kickoff I line. I know, yeah. I know. The kicker at the you end see, there. You see, you just never know what's <laughs> going to happen. Although you recovered so nicely and so <laughs> authentically that it Actually, went over Actually, somebody nicely. asked me if, uh, if that was planned. <laughs> to blow the last <laughs> yeah. line? I said, no, not <laughs> no. really. <laughs> That could not have been planned. No, no that planned. could not have been planned. I couldn't have rehearsed that. No. So that was anyway one of the memories of that day. That's I think June 2013. 20. What? Um, no. Yeah. Not, not June. No, January. 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 January 2013. Yeah. June 2014 was the election. Was the election? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. January 2013. Hey. What, what is the? You never get those dates oh, wrong. <laughs> there you go. I haven't slept in the last couple of nights either, but probably for different reasons than you. What's the? Um, what is the strongest memory you have of that day? January 2013, Maple Leaf Gardens, you won the convention. Wow. <laughs> the first thing that comes into my mind was after the first ballot, we're sitting in the box, and um, we had done better on the ex officios than we'd expected. And Tom Allison, who was my campaign manager, was sitting across the box. And the numbers came out. I can't remember exactly what the numbers were, but we were way close. We were only a couple You're of votes, two votes, two back votes of behind of Sandra Patel. Patel. And we thought we were going to be way farther behind. And Tom, when he saw the numbers, he started to get up. And he was going to, you know, he was, he was exuberant. Hmm. But he caught Andrew Bevan's eye and he just sat right down <laughs> because he didn't want to give anything away and he didn't, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so that's the, you know, that was, that was the moment where I thought, holy mackerel, we could do this. We really could do this. The speech was so exciting. And I, you know, I knew I had done it as well as I could have. Um, so that, that is a, a great memory too. But that moment when Tom started to get up <laughs> Was, um, that was that was pretty memorable. The other thing that I remember uh, really clearly is um, in that back and forth of who's coming to us and who's not coming to us. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you remember Eric Hoskins. So we knew that Eric was going to come to us. He was going to bring his delegates. It's funny you us. say that because he'd made a deal to go to Sandra Pupatello already. I, who knows? Who knows what the conversations oh, okay. were? I, I, you know what? I, we, I'm not going to rehash that. All I know is that this is a funny story, Steve. <laughs> He started to walk out on the floor, and it looked like he was going across the floor and not coming to us. And I was like to my guys, well, what's going on? And we didn't know what was happening. And then he did a sharp left, and he came, he came over to us. So it was, that was, a, that was a, an anxious moment, when I, but when I look back on it, it was, um, it was pretty hilarious. You know what he said at the time? He got lost. I know. It was, I think that's the floor was so packed. He got lost. It, didn't it know was, where was just going. a wave of people, yeah. and he didn't yeah. know. He didn't know where he was yeah. going. Yeah. Anyway, there are great memories and anxious memories. Anxious memories. What's the anxious memory? Well, you're anxious the whole time. Oh. You, from the moment you walk in, you just, you know, you don't know where it's going to land. You just don't know. Well, we did not know. I told you afterwards, I think, when we did that interview afterwards, I said, as soon as I saw the first ballot results, I knew you'd won, and surely you yeah, did but there too. Was, yeah, but Steve, there was lead up to that first ballot. Okay, <laughs> like okay. You had a whole right, campaign, and yeah, it was, uh, sure, I, I'm saying when I saw the first ballot, yeah. then we were, we were pretty happy, but there'd been a lot of hours and a lot of days leading up to that. Fair enough. I don't know if you know this, but you've done almost two dozen interviews in this studio uh, during your really? time in public life. Yeah, really? I went back and looked at some of them, and... Um, you got appointed Minister of Education on the 18th of September in 2006. Six. And about a week and a half later, you were in this studio. Want to okay. see what you look like? <laughs> oh, yay. <laughs> Here we go. Kathleen Wynne, Education Minister, September 2006. Roll it. I am a product of the public education system in Ontario, Steve. I believe in it. I think that it's a, I think that it's a fundamental cornerstone in our democracy. And I'm uh, one of the things that I'm most pleased about having an opportunity to work at this job is that I, I have the opportunity to, to continue to improve it. Because I don't, I don't think it, it was ever destroyed. I think that in the Harris years, it was denigrated. And I think teachers lost heart. And that was a really bad thing. So I am very proud to be part of a government that wants to turn that around. I'm going to ask you to be very introspective here in our last few minutes. But what is the biggest difference, you think, between that rookie cabinet minister and this 
former premier today? Apart from the age. You don't look that different. Come on. <laughs> um, I have just grappled with so many more hard decisions. You know, um, I think I, I think I understand the complexity of governing way better than I did then. Um, but, but I don't. My belief system's no different. You know, I mean, what I'm saying there is exactly what I still believe. So there hasn't been, you know, there hasn't been a, a disillusionment or a move away from that core set of beliefs. You don't so, dislike politics a lot more today? No. With all the viciousness and, you know, politics of personal destruction and all of that? No, because it is, it is the, um, it's the forum where we can change people's lives, where we can make decisions that build a future. Uh, I mean, I think it's just a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. And That's all true, but a lot of it's gotten pretty gross, too. Yeah, it's, it, it's gotten gross. But you know what, Steve? People live with difficulty in their lives. People live with horrible situations, you know? And so being a politician where, you know, you get some insults thrown at you and there's viciousness, um, it's hard, but it's not as hard as a lot of the situations that people live in, right? You know, there are people living in pain. There are people who don't have the resources that they need to look after their families. Um, there, are, there are people who are living with mental illness who can't, you know, who don't have the capacity to, to even keep a home together. I mean, I am a lucky, lucky woman. And I have had the opportunity to serve in the highest office of this province. So, you know, for me to, for me to look back at all those opportunities I've had, I feel, I just feel blessed. And so I get that it's, I get that it's a, it can be a dirty business. It, it absolutely can be. But I can tell you that for all of that, what I say to young people now is it is totally worth it. You can change people's lives. I have people come up to me literally every day who will say, thank you for helping my kid get into college or university. Thank you for raising the minimum wage. You made such a difference to our family. I mean, you can't, you just can't have that kind of impact anywhere else, I think. Well, we're always grateful that you've accepted our invitations to come into this studio Thank and talk you. to us about your life and your career in politics and the decisions you've made. And we should point out for the record that we've had 26 premiers in Ontario, and even though uh, it may feel to some like you weren't there for that long. You're the 10th longest serving premier of all time out of 26. So glad you keep track of those numbers. Someone's got to. Someone's, <laughs> Someone's got to do it. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. That's Kathleen Wynne, 25th premier of the province of Ontario and still the MPP for Don Valley West. Thank you, premier. Thanks. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.